Dogs are known as man's best friend. They enrich our lives and become part of the family. But how would you feel if you found out your canine companion began life in the equivalent of a battery farm? We have um, a deceased puppy uh, in with a, a, a live puppy. According to campaign groups, one in three dogs bought in the UK are from mass breeding establishments. And that's a worrying statistic considering the detrimental health effects this can have on dogs and the emotional trauma for owners. It's basically uh, uh, a tiny, tiny baby animal full of disease. Life on a puppy farm can be bleak. Large numbers of dogs are kept in confined and squalid conditions and veterinary care is rare. This footage is from anti-puppy farming campaign group Cariad. They're calling for a change in the law because perhaps surprisingly, puppy farms are not illegal as long as they're licensed. However, the problem is that a lot of councils don't have the resources to carry out inspections and determine whether a breeder is genuine or farming puppies for profit. Somebody that keeps dogs not as pets, but in order to repeatedly breed them, often inbreeding and giving little thought to their animal's welfare. Lucy, I adopted um, two and a half years ago, and she was about five or six then. Um, with any rescue, you don't really know the definite sort of age but she was severely neglected. I mean, now she's just under seven kilos. When she was rescued, she was only three and a half, which for a cavalier is just unheard of, really. But she had um, been kept either from in cramped conditions or just from pure fear. She'd adopted a stance where her um, back was really curved, so her back feet touched her front feet. Her ears had been cut really short as well. She had all bowl patches to her fur, um, her legs were extremely discoloured from being kept in her own urine and faeces um, and she smelt what can I describe as sort of burning flesh which is from the urine because it burns their skin if they're left in it for any length of time. Annabelle was rescued from a puppy farm in June and I adopted her not long after she'd actually been rescued. When I first saw her, she was in quite a state. She had been, I mean now her fur has grown, but she'd been clipped really, really short. She didn't even look like a cavalier. She's had a few health problems. She had to have 14 teeth removed, which would have been, I would imagine, due to poor diet and them not being looked after for sort of seven years. She's fine when she's on the ground as well. Um, she seems you know, a happy, sort of really loving dog. If you pick her up, she's really, really fearful. I think she associates that now with if you pick her up, you're taking her off for something to happen to her. And it's horrible to think that she's been damaged at that point, um, that she she still feels like that, even though I know she's really happy here. I think some sort of psychological things do stay with them for, for the duration, really. Many breeding dogs will not get out alive. They will be shot or they will be drowned or strangled. Um, Amy had had um, God knows how many litters of puppies. She had obviously had a, a litter of puppy, puppies every time she came into season because her undercarriage was literally on the floor. She was uh, taken to a vet and spayed and the vet had to cut away an awful lot of her excess skin just to make her comfortable. Uh, she had teeth broken off at the gum line from chewing on bars. Her claws had never been clipped, and because the um, the quicks had grown to the end of the nails, it made it impossible to then trim them back. So she was perpetually like this, you know. Unfortunately, Amy was only with me for uh, about 18 months before I discovered that she had a lump, which then turned out to be mast cell tumour, and. Um, even though she was at that point eight years old, just, uh, just over eight years old, I felt that uh, she deserved a fighting chance to have some sort of life. God knows she had suffered enough in her first seven years. So with agreement with the vet, um, we went to a special oncology clinic and she had six months of chemotherapy, which she tolerated brilliantly. She also had to have um, uh, one of her toes removed and you know, so quite a lot of recovery time there. She beat the cancer, which was absolutely brilliant, you know, and then six months later, she developed lymphoma. And from that, there was no going back. 
and a few months later I had to make that decision and, and have her put to sleep. And it felt so unfair that she had come through all of this and yet at the end it was basically through bad breeding that she had become a, one of the susceptible breeds to cancer. And that's another area that people don't realise. These breeding dogs are genetically challenged in many ways. All of Amy's litters of puppies, and she must have had, in that seven years, she could have easily had, you know, 12 litters of puppies. All those puppies, all of her beautiful little golden retriever puppies that are out there now, a large percentage of those will have the gene that will cause cancer so they won't live a long and happy life. I pushed the unlocked door to the interior kennel and my heart sank. I have never felt such a terrible feeling of despair. I had entered the canine equivalent of Auschwitz. A metal garden waste incinerator loomed by the gate. I lifted the lid and saw the decomposed and partially incinerated remains of dogs. Some puppies die before they are sold. We have um, a deceased puppy uh, in with a, a, a live puppy. And the survivors often face serious health issues. I found a pup aid uh, about five years ago because I saw a load of puppies coming into my practice at the time, all dying of parvovirus. And I researched where they were being um, purchased and it was a local puppy farm dealer that was buying them in from a puppy farm in Wales all totally legal. Uh, I thought this isn't right and the puppies were dying, they were on drips, they were in a lot of pain, they were costing the owners a lot of money in veterinary treatment. So yeah, it's a, it's a big campaign now. It started basically just from being frustrated and angry seeing animals in, in such pain. Um, you mentioned parvovirus, what are some of the other like key things that you see in dogs that are from puppy farms in terms of health issues, both mentally and physically? Absolutely, and surgically. So you've got um, a number of uh, issues, basically they're, they're inbred, um, they're kept in very poor conditions, uh, they're not obviously not health tested. So in terms of medical conditions, core, you've got all the viruses, so you've got parvovirus, uh, you've got bacterial infections like Campylobacter, you've got Giardia, uh, kennel cough obviously, pneumonia, E. coli, so you've got all those causing coughs and vomiting and diarrhoea. Uh, you've got surgical problems, so you've got sort of knee problems and elbow problems, eye problems, uh, heart problems, all those sort of um, real serious issues. And you've also got uh, behavioural problems as well. So you've got nervous aggression. Um, you've got animals that are terrified when they, when they leave their mum too early because they haven't been socialised. So all in all, when someone buys a pup that's been born on a puppy farm, and this pup has been born sometimes hundreds of miles away, been removed from its mum too early, and then transported in a van across the country to a pet shop or a pet shop licence holder, uh, it's basically a ticking time bomb. So when it's seen in the pet shop and it's just a bit tired, it's basically... Uh, uh, a tiny, tiny baby animal full of disease that's, with the next move, going to explode with disease. This is the problem that one woman from Plymouth found when her new spaniel's health deteriorated and she needed a blood transfusion. It then emerged that there were problems with the new puppy's paperwork. The pedigree certificate looked as though it had been doctored, and although the seller is from Wiltshire, the vaccination record showed that the puppy was treated in Wales. The country campaign groups hold responsible for 80% of puppy farms in the UK. The problem is, most people don't buy straight from a puppy farm. They buy from a dealer, and these people buy in puppies cheap from puppy farms and sell them on for profit, often from their own house, which makes it an easy trap to fall into. And when confronted with customers whose puppies have fallen ill, some puppy farmers and dealers are less than sympathetic. She was absolutely riddled with fleas, and the vet said she's going to need a blood transfusion from Mr Kendo. He said, I told you, if anything goes wrong, you phone me. And he said, I'll bring you a replacement. I said, what is she, a broken toy? I didn't have the feeling, wouldn't have the feelings for that dog that I had for Ruby, yeah. I bonded with her. In total, Sue racked up £1,200 in vet's bills. Some people who confront puppy farmers have even been threatened. When people have so much to hide, they're dangerous. Have you yourself ever been threatened? Over the years, I've been in situations which were really frightening. I've had a shotgun pointed at me, have my car driven off the road. If they find out where you live, you get death threats. I decided to confront the man who sold Sue her puppy over the phone. Hello, is that Richard Kendall? It's 
speaking. Hello, I spoke to you on the phone earlier. I'm a journalist and I'm making a documentary about puppy farming. I've been speaking to Sue Smith and she claims that you're selling puppies from a puppy farm. Can you confirm if this is true? Yeah, right there. Uh, you better check with the police because she, she's been interviewed, Sue Smith. Uh, and I, if she's been talking to you, then I'll, I'll, I'll better go and phone the police and uh, let them go and see her. So you're not going to comment on whether this is true? Uh, best you go and talk to Sue Smith, all right? I've spoken to her. She also accused you of fabricating her puppy's pedigree certificate. Do you have Look, a comment on that? I have no comment. They've already done a TV programme on it, OK? And uh, let Sue Smith deal with the police. So okay? I'll phone the police now. Is it not true that your puppies are sourced from Wales? <coughs> I don't, I've got no comment to make, OK? I suggest you talk to Sue Smith. She knows everything. I then also wrote Richard Kendall a letter, offering him the chance to respond to Sue's allegations. After Sue took Mr Kendall to the small claims court, he has been made to pay the cost of her puppy's veterinary treatment, as he didn't turn up to the hearing, and so the court ruled in Sue's favour. However, although he is said to have deceived Sue, he's not actually breaking the law by selling these puppies, as he has a licence. And this is why campaign groups are trying to raise awareness and calling for a change in the law. So we've got a situation where legislation is allowing it to happen. Um, we've got a situation where the demand means the supply is generated because of this hunger for a puppy. Uh, unfortunately, rescue pets suffer because rescue pets get overlooked because they're not cute and fluffy, um, even though they're neutered and microchipped and uh, temperament tested and house trained. They're bargains, really, but they're overlooked because everyone wants that cute puppy. When you're, when you're looking online, Google the mobile number of the seller because that usually brings up pages and pages of different litters. But really, if you really want a, a puppy, you have to see it with its mum. It's, there's no question about it. A good breeder will make you go to the to their breeding establishment. They will interview you as much as you will interview them and you won't be able to take a puppy away on the spot. They will expect you to come back and visit again and again throughout that suckling phase of the puppy. So you will always see a puppy suckling with the mother first and then later, eight to 10 weeks, you'll be able to come back and take your chosen puppy home. But with a puppy farm, they can't do that. They don't want you to see how these breeding dogs are being kept. Um, and so they use dealers. And these dealers are normally licensed pet shop holders. That's where it gets very confusing because pet shop license doesn't just mean a retail establishment. A pet shop license holder can be someone operating from a front room in their house. And therein lies a big problem. You're an animal lover and a We've come here today to try and raise awareness about puppy farming in the UK and we're calling for new legislation. We need stricter breeding controls. So 1951 Pet Animal Act is in desperate need of being overhauled. Well, the government really doesn't listen to welfare as much as it listens to industry. The fear is, um, is that if you ban puppies and kittens from pet shops, for example, or being sold by pet shop license holders, the third parties and the dealers, it will lead to a, a ban on fish in pet shops or um, lizards. So really, shops who sell all these pets have, have got kind of a stranglehold on the industry. Last year we came that bit closer to seeing an end to puppy farming after new legislation came into force in Wales. The new law states that puppies can't be taken away from their mums until they're at least eight weeks old. All breeding dogs and puppies must be microchipped and there needs to be at least one member of staff per 20 dogs at a breeding establishment. Breeders also need to show that their puppies are adequately socialised and all their dogs are environmentally enriched. However, until we see a change in legislation nationwide, or at least an updated way of enforcing the law, puppy farming will continue.